so imagine if I had on a costume so that you actually could not see any of, of, my, of my body. You only saw the costume, my face, my hands, everything was completely covered. And yet I could be moving around, and, and, and yet the costume is not alive. I am animating it in the sense that I am moving it. So the same way the soul is moving this body. So that's why there's equality. This is the vision of this great civilization, that it doesn't matter what kind of body you have. It doesn't matter gender, it doesn't, race doesn't matter, and species doesn't matter. Everything that lives is sacred. And you want environmentalism, you want a good philosophy to, to, to for environmentalism, you've got it. For example, I'll give two examples, one from the indigenous and another from uh, ancient, an ancient uh, society in southern India. There are people, indigenous peoples, that live in the Amazon rainforest, or Amazon jungles, who believe that actually the world is the world is enchanted in the sense that let's say there's a forest, you have to go to the forest, you have to cut a tree because you, you have to build a canoe, and so on. The forest doesn't belong to you. Human beings never own forests. The forest actually belongs to divine power. Now, whether they have an animistic conception, polytheistic, monotheistic, or whatever, I mean, for the purpose of this point, it's, it's, it's not the point. They have the basic idea that there is some personal divine power which made the forest and which therefore has rights over the forest. So if you need a canoe, and you really need a canoe, you have to get permission. For example, in Italy, there's a goddess who actually presides over that forest. And so you have to, first of all, you have to get permission. You have to understand that you are taking something, that you are disturbing other living things who want to live as much as you do. Here's another example from South India. Uh, this comes from, anyway, it, it's a genre of ancient Central literature called Akhara text. Let's say that these were Vaishnavas, people that, that worshipped or uh, Krishna or Vishnu by different names. So they want to build a temple. They want to build a temple as the center of their civilization to show that God is the center of reality. They want to show it architecturally, that God is the center of reality. So to build a temple, to build anything, to build a building then as now, you have to level the land. You, know, you don't build on tilted land. So they, they, need a, they need a level, so they have to level the land. Now, in those days, they didn't have tractors, so they used plows. Now, a plow, they'd carve out of wood. They didn't want to use an ordinary plow because this is a, what they would call in Sanskrit, a deva grita, the house of God. Therefore, they want, to, they want to carve a special plow which is used for this sacred activity. So they go into the forest, and they have to cut a tree down to get the wood to make the plow. But they understand that every tree is not only a life itself, it actually is the center of, of a large community. Because birds live on that tree, insects, squirrels, I mean, I mean other forest animals take shelter because you know there can be lethal heat even for animals. They take shelter, especially in tropical forests, in the shade of the tree. So it, it's actually a large, complex community of living things that want to live, who are all centered around that tree. So when they cut the tree down, they understand they are gravely disturbing a community, a community of life. And therefore, they first of all they address those living beings, and they you know they express sincere regret, and they pray for those living beings, all of them, every living thing that they are disturbing. They they, they, and they sincerely pray to God to bless these creatures and somehow compensate them for the loss they are suffering at our hands. And then they cut the tree down. So you can understand that you're not going to cut down billions of trees to print pornography or junk mail if, that, if you have that kind of world. So it's actually what we're trying to present is not just it, 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 it's, it's not just a philosophy, and there is a magnificent philosophy. It's not just a spiritual process, and there is a very powerful spiritual process. It's a whole spiritual way of.
constructing civilization, and we're not using it as guinea pigs. It's not like, you know, I was meditating, got this great idea, so now I'm going to sort of try it out on you, and if I wreck your life, sorry. It's actually a civilization that worked for thousands of years. It's sustained. We not only have Megosthenes, Greek ambassador, we have Chinese pilgrims who, who, who went from China to India because Buddha was lived in India. They wanted to visit the holy places where Buddha did things, just like, let's say, Christians go to, 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 to Israel or Jews. So the Chinese, we have the, the testimony of Chinese pilgrims. And in the Chinese, if you know about ancient Chinese civilization, they were meticulous, meticulous record keepers and, and, and observers. They, the records we have, the records of ancient Chinese dynasties are, are amazing in terms of how, just how serious and, and, and professional they were about keeping records. So we have Chinese pilgrims going to India and writing about their experiences and describing a, a very amazing civilization. And there are others. So we have third party accounts, not just a civilization kind of like promoting itself. So, um, The last point I'll make, and then if you have any questions, so I'll be happy to take a shot. And that is that then why do we chant Hare Krishna? We chant because there is a, an understanding that when we deal with an absolute being, you can say God or the absolute or the source or just you know whatever, but when we deal with an absolute being, there is actually no difference between the being itself and the name of that being. This comes up in Western philosophy in a, in a, a dialogue played over the uh, platonic dialogue called the Cratylus. If you want to look that up, uh, the Y Cratylus. Namely, what is the relationship between an object and its name? Can there ever be a situation where an object and its name are existentially one? It's interesting, this idea comes up also in the Bible, by the way. It comes up very because in the Old Testament, when uh, in, in the descriptions of the first temple built in Jerusalem, the temple uh, uh, conceived by David, built by his son Solomon, um, it said over and, over and over again in the Bible, the Old Testament, that the, it was a temple built to the name of God. It was a temple built for the name. And the name of God lives in the temple as God lives in heaven. You find this in Buddhism, in, in the Chen and so, so whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Christianity, whether, whether it's Judaism, whether it's this ancient Vedic civilization, Krishna, there is a common understanding that on the spiritual plane, an object that's named is an be one. And therefore, uh, when we chant or sing or remember or read whatever, names of the absolute of God, in any language, this is not sectarian, it doesn't matter what language, it doesn't matter what tradition you're in. You just have to mean, if your intention is the source of everything or God, that's what you mean. Whatever language, whatever, whatever you say, uh, you get points. It's just like, for example, let's say you have children, and, and let's say your child is crying out for you. You're not going to say, sorry, kid, you didn't pronounce my name right. You know, that's, you're, you garbled it as baby talk. <laughs> so until you really say my name the way I like to hear it, I, I, can't, I can't feed you, I can't do a thing for you. I mean, obviously that's absurd. So just as a, a loving mother or father knows when, when the child is calling out to them and they respond, it doesn't matter how articulate the child is. In the same way, if your intention is to call out to the absolute, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can just say, hey, you, and you know, that counts. So it doesn't matter what language, it doesn't matter what religion, it is the universal act of meditating on, chanting, names of the absolute. In the case of Krishna, we, we have a certain predilection for these names because, not because they're exclusive, not because other names are false, it's not that. It's because, as I said, Krishna means, it, it indicates that the infinite beauty of God is the absolute, and, and God is an infinite source of pleasure, and also acknowledges that the absolute truth is both masculine and feminine. And so, um, so that why do we fall in love in this world? Why are all of us kind of infected with romantic <laughs> ideas? Uh, 
because it exists in the source of our existence. We come from the source, from an absolute source. And love, on an absolute plane, love, personal love, falling in love actually exists in the absolute. It is a universal, eternal, beautiful thing that people can love each other. And so it's not, you, it, it just, and when it's spiritualized, romantic love, when it's spiritualized, actually becomes a yoga practice. It becomes a spiritual practice when that love, when, when you understand the other person is actually a spiritual being, and two people as spiritual beings fall in love with each other, it's a spiritual process because it's originally spiritual. So that Hare Krishna and Hare Rama, I mean, you can tell any names of God. I mean, really, it's your choice. Isn't it? But this one really is, uh, <laughs> if you can somehow connect with God as a source of pleasure, a source of beauty, it, it makes your spiritual life better. So, uh, <laughs> any questions on any of these points? I think, can we also argue, claim that perhaps science is still evolving and the spiritual of metaphysical realm is more, more completed, more um, developed, then let's say, 500 years ago, nobody could prove that there was a virus, but they exist. They just couldn't prove it because they were undeveloped yet, right? Uh, and now science has proven they can affirm that exists because uh, because there are tools that allow them to prove. But the fact that the science doesn't have enough tools to prove something, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Science will be the first to admit that we're still evolving. That's the you know, kind of like the battle cry that we test and we investigate and we try to falsify and we, we're still growing. So yes, it's um, And also we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that spiritual knowledge has to be like material science. That's really when uh, Western civilization kind of collapsed in terms of philosophy. And that's why hardly anyone Because philosophy is sort of self-destructive by attacking itself, by attacking metaphysics. So, and so now you have like philosophy basically trying to ape the hard sciences. And so a lot of modern analytic philosophy is just kind of like this algebra where they're trying to show that they're scientific and they mean mathematical. And, hey, what about the philosophy? <laughs> so it's a mistake. I mean, just that, and just as it's a mistake, let's say, for me to say, well, according to the Bhagavad Gita, I can tell you everything about uh, astronomy, or everything about uh, everything you know about biomedical research. No, everyone has their contribution to make, and so wisdom, spiritual knowledge, is not going to realize itself by trying to pretend it's like physical science. And so yes, there is a sense in which it is a mature spiritual science, it's a mature science, and uh, and eventually the, the, the other side, the physical science, you know, eventually may, I mean, they're already getting there. Like they're preparing, you know, the string theory and the parallel universes. That was there thousands of years ago in the century of literature. They talk about billions of universes. So, and now we're talking about you know multi-dimensionality mm -hmm. and all this stuff. Or you can just save time and repeat this wisdom. Yeah. You may not live long enough for science. <laughs> so any other questions? Yes, please. With regards to your um, point about all the values, or I guess I call the values that we share on the physical level, how would you explain to people that might not? Um, I don't think. Yeah, have an explanation for it now, but when people do like children, people don't feel bad about it, you know, don't really share those values at all. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Like sociopaths. 
So I, I once had the uh, privilege of being attacked by a lion. I was I was actually in the Caracas Zoo in Venezuela, and uh, it's by local law up there, and uh, I was kind of in the Caracas at the time. And, uh, and so we went to the lion cage with a friend of mine, and I was wearing saffron robes. This was my friend, and this lion, this male lion, just somehow or other, he went crazy. I don't know what it was about us. Maybe we had the smell of incense on the robes or something. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but this lion just went nuts. And it, 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 it like went back, retreated to its cage, and went into its like attack pose. And actually, the lioness came and said, like, calm down here. Yeah. <laughs> I can see the lioness was saying, like, calm down, you know, you're in a zoo. You can't. <laughs> but this lion, it just, it, it, just like in the wildlife movies, it just ran straight at us. Unfortunately, it was ran straight at us and just threw itself against the fence. Really? And roaring, and, and I remember there was a, a, a lady next to me with a, she had like, like a little bag of things, you know, grocery bag or something, with a child, and she actually dropped her bag. So, because this lion just, and, and, and it, it's been crazy, it kept throwing itself again and again, just throwing its body against the cage. It was just mad to get at us. God. And uh, fortunately, Fences held. And, uh, <laughs> and tell, so, what I mean to say is, when you stare into the face of a predator like that, True. when you look into the eyes of a lion that's trying to kill you, and there's just nothing, there, there's like zero empathy, nothing, <laughs> zero. And so, yes, yeah, someone, someone who has a human body, but who really has their consciousness is like that of a wild beast. They have become a beast. Or worse than a beast, because you know, lions kill, you know, these animals kill when they're hungry. And, and, and so to kill just wantonly, it's, it, it's almost, it, it's not only bestial, there is an element of evil in it. Because it, it, it's no, you could say, you know, lions, they don't kill, they starve to death. But their children will starve to feed their kids. But just these people, as you say, the psychopaths or sociopaths, it's, it's, it's evil. There really is such a thing as evil in the world. And, uh, you know, not that we have to believe in the devil, but, but there are people who somehow embody it, at least for some time. And then the universe is made in such a way. That's what karma, you know, then, then, then karma kicks in. And they're given sort of cosmic sensitivity training. It's like people that say, like in corporations, sometimes they find that, that within the corporate culture of some big organization, there's systematic racism sexism or something. And so often you'll see that when it comes to the court and, and they're you know, found guilty of the systematic corporate discrimination, that among the penalties, the consequences, that the people who did this have to take sensitivity training. They, they have to go through these courses where they learn how to develop a normal human empathy. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, karma is like cosmic sensitivity training. Because if someone does that to other living things, then it, ha it happens to you. So that there's a word for, for meat in Sanskrit, mong sa. And mong in Sanskrit is also the first person uh, accused of a personal pronoun. Anyway, it means meat. So, and sa means he. So me, he, which means that, and so the ancient scholar said mong sa means Mangsa Kadati, he believed me. That, that, and we have these stories where, where if I participate in brutalizing innocent creatures in the future, they will come back. And they will get me, and, and they will do it to me. And that's the way the universe, through these laws, is showing you this is what it felt like. It's like that great Bob Dylan song that I first heard when I was, I think, 17, Cruising Sunset Strip. <laughs> my, my mother's car. You know, that song, How Does It Feel? Like the Rolling Stone. How does it feel? So, so, so that's what karma is. It simply means that when, whatever you do, it comes back to you. And then you know what it felt like. So uh, these people somehow are, somehow they have to be retaught. They have the power of empathy. Well, 
Again, thank you so much for coming. It's uh, I'm really happy to see all of you. We'll, maybe we'll just chat for five more minutes, and then we have a little some refreshments for the or a lot of refreshments. Yeah. But again, thank you. Very